Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. Welcome to Practical AI, a weekly podcast about making artificial intelligence practical, productive, and accessible to everyone. This is where conversations around AI, machine learning, and data science happen. Join the community and Slack with us around various topics of the show at changelaw.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at Practical AI FM. And now onto the show. Welcome to another episode of Practical AI. This is the podcast where we try to make AI practical, productive, and accessible to everyone. I am Chris Benson, one of your co-hosts. I am the chief AI strategist at Lockheed Martin RMS API Innovations. And with me is my co-host, Daniel Whitenack, a data scientist with SIL International. How's it going today, Daniel? It's going great. How about with you, Chris? Doing good. What you been up to lately? Well, uh, I finished out my course that I was teaching at uh, at Purdue University, so I'm enjoying one grading and uh, then uh, throwing some eggnog in there when I can uh, when I can pair the two. That's that's working out well. <laughs> Sounds great. As I mentioned, as we opened up, uh, I actually started this new job at Lockheed Martin. Very excited about it. Uh, been been ramping up on that, and I've never worked for a defense uh, contractor before, so I'm learning all sorts of new things, you know, about how to apply AI, and it has been absolutely fascinating the last couple of weeks doing that. Yeah, it's exciting. Don't share too much, uh, or you'll you'll have to have to kill us. I'm sure. Yeah, I'll have to kill myself. Uh, so there we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I wanted to uh, introduce our guest today. Our guest has become a, a good friend of mine in recent months. Uh, Susan Etlinger is an industry analyst with uh, Altimeter, which is a profit company. And Susan and I met at the Adobe AI Think Tank uh, earlier this year in New York City, where she moderated a 90-minute broadcast on Facebook, and I was privileged enough to be one of the people on the panel. How's it going today, Susan? I'm great. Thank you. It made it sound like we spent the entire 90 minutes talking about Facebook, but we actually talked about AI. <laughs> very tr I'm glad you said that. Very, very true. Yeah, we had a, a great panel and talked about AI with a lot of, of really smart people that they were able to contribute to that conversation. And so it was a great, uh, great time to meet. And uh, I've enjoyed talking to you ever since. And it became obvious really, really early on that I had to try to uh, twist your arm to get to see if you would come on to our podcast, because there is so much about the world of AI that you know. And fortunately for us, you have just, I know that you have been working on a report that is fascinating called the Maturity Model for AI and Enterprise, where you're talking about AI in, uh, in enterprise and in the industry. And I was wondering if we could start off with you just telling us a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it's just gone live uh, as we're recording this. So by the time this podcast airs, everybody's going to be able to see it. So what I've been trying to do over the course of the past, you know, depends on how you count it. Uh, several months to several years is, is understand a little bit about the way that artificial intelligence is evolving, not just as a technology or as a, as a kind of societal or social impact, but also just in terms of the impact on business. You know, because the impact on business is so different in so many ways, the kind of enterprise impact versus the consumer impact, that I wanted to try to get a handle on it. So this report is about two major things. One is kind of what are the four trends that are really affecting the way that enterprises implement AI. And those four trends have to do with how we interact, you know, moving from rules, uh, screens to senses. So moving from URLs to kind of speech and images and that sort of thing. The next is around how we decide. And that is, um, you know, moving from the old way of programming, if then statements. So, you know, from business rules to probabilities, you know, because AI is, of course, inherently probabilistic. The third is around how we innovate. And, you know, in the past or actually in the current, in the future, we're going to go to more of a kind of a data engineering world where we're actually incorporating data into the engineering process in a much more fluid way than we can do today. And that's something, Chris, that your insights really helped me shape. You know, today we're kind of in many, in many places anyway, we're in a sort of reporting on the past kind of world and, and we need to be able to use data in a much more forward, forward thinking way. And then the last is around how we lead, you know, because we live in a world that's very hierarchical. 
that's very expertise driven. And of course, data uh, and the ability to get clean data is going to help us um, make decisions based on data. I've had the ability to go ahead and read this. I know you had quoted me as one of a number of people in the article and let me see a preview. And the big thing that I really was thinking through this process was how much I wish I had had this over the last couple of years as I worked for uh, previous employers and trying to put together the business case and the operational aspects of AI teams. So, you know, we're starting to see uh, organizations like Google and uh, Amazon and stuff offering up some of their internals. But this report, the AI maturity playbook that you've put out is a huge, huge tool uh, to get people started in this. And I uh, wish I'd had it all along. And D Daniel, were you going to say something? I was just going to say it's it's interesting that the thing that stood out to me when you were talking through that is is kind of the emphasis on engineering that you were talking about and integration within a company's infrastructure. And I don't know if you've seen this, maybe you can comment on this, but it seems like we've seen a trend, at least when I'm looking at like job postings and people's titles and, and such. And there was kind of a time when we were talking about, oh, everybody needs to be a data scientist and we're all going to use data for stuff. And then like it kind of moved into everybody needs to be doing like AI and be an AI person or machine learning person, scientist. And then like now it's kind of drifted into, I see a lot of job titles looking for like machine learning engineers or AI engineers or data science engineers, whatever that is. But I think it's like people are gradually coming to the realization that they actually have to do some type of integration of this stuff in their in their infrastructure. Yeah. I, I don't know. Are, are people feeling that pain? What's pushing that side of things forward? Yeah, well, it's funny because this topic, this issue of sort of data analytics to data science to data engineering really popped up in my interview with Chris, you know, not to do too much log rolling here, but I mean, it's really where I started to think about it. And so in the subsequent interviews, when I spoke to other people, I asked them, you know, and even just people that I know in the industry who weren't necessarily formally interviewed for the report. And I'd say, so what, you know, how is this working for you? Like, if it's a startup, what are you seeing with your clients? Or if it's a big enterprise plat, you know, kind of enterprise platform, what are you seeing? And then in enterprise companies, I was asking them, like, kind of, where are you on this spectrum? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, because we've brought in all these data scientists who have a very particular way of, of working. And the challenge is getting to scale, you know, and getting to be able to build, you know, not just models, but products that we can scale across the organization. And that's a whole, you know, not only a technical challenge, but a cultural one as well. And also a recruiting challenge in terms of trying to figure out what are the qualities we should be hiring for in order to be able to build scalable infrastructure. So that's been, you know, that's been kind of a, uh, or scalable products. And that's been kind of a big theme, really, that I wasn't, I didn't really know to expect. When we had that conversation, Susan, and, and we're discussing that, it was, I found it in my own experience as I went into a previous employer and was creating a, a full AI operation within that organization that a big surprise for me had been that I was hiring on some new people and I was pulling people from other parts of the organization and I had a, a mixture of skills there. And some of our team members were just straight data scientists in a lot of cases, fresh out of school. And that had been their exclusive focus. And being this new field of, you know, neural network uh, model creation and, and such, uh, I think myself and, and others on the team really expected that to be the strongest skill set. And what we were surprised to find was some of the other members of the team had already been in industry and had created products and services for other companies uh, or previously for the same company. Um, they had been programmers in various other roles, and they had moved in uh, and maybe gone back to school in some cases for data science and to learn this. And I was surprised that those people were able to apply the after model creation, that they were able to apply that better after the fact. And so in some ways, potentially the people who had focused exclusively on this had, had a, a leg up. But as soon as some of the others caught up with them, the fact that they knew how to deploy and how to meet a business need from in terms of products and services was a huge advantage for that crowd. And that was something that surprised us all. Yeah. And, you know, I think what's interesting is that this seems like just part of the evolution. You know, if we think back on other technologies and how they became, you know, kind of enterprise ready, 
you know, you see similar trajectories where you're hiring for a skill and that skill may or may not come with another set of, (laughs) with another particular set of skills, right? That's a challenge with every technology, but I think particularly with AI, because there is so much hiring that comes, you know, directly out of the academic setting. And that's such a different, it's such a different set of expectations. So I'm curious on your, your opinion on, um, on the following in light, in light of that, And in light of the other things that you mentioned that are changing around how we will be interacting with systems, for example, and how systems will be more dynamic and and reactive, do you think, you know, for the software engineers out there that are listening to this podcast that are maybe interested in, in AI, I know that there's like some concern among software engineers that they're kind of being like their job will need to drastically change and that sort of thing as AI is more integrated into into the products that we're building. Do you do you see that like software engineering as a whole is going to see a, a very dramatic shift or will it more be like AI is just going to be something they interact with, but, you know, it'll be another layer in the stack or something like that? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny, Daniel. I mean, I can answer as a non-software engineer just in terms of what I've observed And what I've observed is I I don't think I've ever seen a software engineer who hasn't had to change, you know, who hasn't had to evolve their skills, who hasn't had to figure out something that they weren't expecting. You know, if you think back to the beginnings of the Internet, like that was a massive, massive change in the mid 90s and the early 2000s, you know, and the development of even like social technologies and so and mobile technologies and all of that, you know, every single time there's a massive shift, there's a massive set of changes that reverberate through the industry. And I just don't ever see that changing, you know, and then in terms of kind of the long view, I do think that learn, you know, intelligent systems, the ability to learn from data, autonomous systems, that's going to be table stakes. I don't know how many years, you know, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball, but it's going to be what we're, what we're thinking of as sort of exotic now is going to be table stakes. And that's really a lot of the thrust of the report too. So I know that having had the advantage of seeing it ahead of time, you, you started off the report kind of talking about some of the macro trends that would affect AI and stuff. And, and you were really thoughtful in how you were approaching how kind of the real world would affect this. You talked to, I remember about um, kind of the interactions that we're having with computing. I remember one of the, the sections was talking about as we move from screens to different senses that we may not have used uh, historically. And then I believe you went on to kind of uh, how we decide, how we innovate, how we lead. And I was just kind of wondering, um, you know, what some of those insights were that we could share with our listeners. So, you know, the screen thing, you know, how we interact is really interesting because we're just so used to, you know, if you're older than like, you know, 30, you know, you're used to interacting with a laptop computer or even a desktop computer and a phone. You know, if you're younger than 30, more of your life has been spent, you know, talking to your phone and talking to that weird little cylinder on your dining room table or your thermostat or whatever it is, you know, that you're talking to. We're certainly becoming much more, uh, much more accepting of things like facial recognition and image recognition, although, you know, obviously that comes with issues. And there are even people who are working on sensory-based interactions based on smell and taste, you know, so like none of our senses is actually, you know, none of our senses is going to be left behind. And of course, touch, you know, using haptics and pinch and zoom are all very normal to us now, you know, and you go back 10 or, or 15 years and like that was just, that was minority report. That was something that lived in science fiction. The biggest shift to me though, of all of these shifts is around how we make decisions because We are so used to living in a world that is based on if-then statements. If my balance drops below $500, send me an alert. If I make a transaction more than $300, send me an alert. If I do a transaction, you know, if I try to buy something in in an airport in Berlin, decline my credit card. And now what we're seeing is that the world is a lot more probabilistic. And sometimes that's fantastic, right? And it's really easy to understand and it's intuitive. And sometimes it actually creates a lot of stress for organizations because, you know, you could say something with an 85 or 87% confidence level is fine for one industry and completely off the table for something else. I mean, I imagine that that creates, I don't know, in my mind, I'm thinking, for a lot of people, maybe including myself in in certain scenarios, that creates a lot of 
trust issues, right? It might be harder for me to understand naturally the the probabilistic way of dealing with all of these complicated scenarios, but I kind of have to put my trust in the modeling at that point, right? And not just kind of in an, an easily understandable if then statement. Yeah, absolutely. The thing is, too, that it's not just about putting your trust in the model, right? It's the engineering and user interface and other kinds of communicative decisions that are made to let you know whether you should trust the data. So I'll give you an example, and this sort of almost kind of is a nice segue into the conversation about ethics. In Turkish, and as in many other languages, there are no gendered pronouns. So the word for he and the word for she are the same. It's actually the word O with the letter O. And if you take the sentence, she is a doctor on Google Translate, you can do this yourself, and you translate it into Turkish, it will come back with O beer doctor. Sorry about the pronunciation, tur- Turkish speakers. And then if you take O beer doctor and you translate that back into English, Google will assume and write he is a doctor. Now, this is probabilistic because if you look at the word to vec data set, uh, we know already that the word doctor, as many other professions, is biased toward male humans, because there are more instances in that data of men being doctors than women being doctors. And even if it's 50.5%, you know, it's going to be a man. And so there, so here's the thing, the language Turk, you know, the Turkish language has been around a bit longer than Google, and yet, and is not likely to change, you know, for Google's sake. And yet, there's no indication when you do Google Translate, that what you're looking at when it says doctor, you've probably got a 97, 98% probability that it's correct. But when you're looking at the O that signifies the gender of the human being discussed, that, you know, it's way, way, way lower. And so what I'm saying is that sometimes we actually need to incorporate into engineering and into user interface design some indication for people that what they're looking at may or may not require further analysis. Yeah, and I do think that this leads right into a great discussion on on ethics, um, which I, I'm eager to get into. But before we kind of jump into those details, I'm wondering if kind of based on what you were just saying, those are kind of real problems, real biases, real kind of dangers, if you want to put it that way, that exists right now in machine learning and, and AI. I'm wondering, like, so much of the conversation around like the danger of AI and other things, people kind of naturally go to the scenario of like the Terminator scenario or consciousness or something, right? Do you think that that, you know, distracts from these real uh, kind of dangers and biases that we're experiencing now? And should we, should we even be having that conversation? Or should we as practitioners kind of, how can we help bring a more balanced view into what, what we should really be talking about in terms of ethics, I guess, is my question. Any of us who work in this field, you know, somebody like me who's an analyst, you know, really with a humanities background versus, you know, you guys who have much, you know, deeper technology, technological chops than I could ever hope to have. Like, you know, you maybe you hang out with your family at the holidays and they ask you what you're working on. You say AI and they're like, when are the robots coming to get us? And that's the conversation really that much of the world is having, right? That the trolley problem, you know, if the car is driving down the road and it has the, you know, it's going to kill one person or five people, or it's going to kill you or, or a woman with a stroller, like all the, that kind of stuff is where people, people's minds naturally go to. And I'm not saying that those are trivial issues. Obviously, they're not. And when you get into things like autonomous uh, weaponry, I mean, that's a whole other topic. But AI isn't a monolith. And so when we think about the both the benefit, you know, the innovation benefit and the risks of AI, we have to think about it in in a particular context. And that context could be something like a financial services context in which you're trying to manage risk, or it could be a diagnostic context in the healthcare industry. And so what I really think is important is for us to understand some of these nearer term issues, some of these very pragmatic, practical issues around what happens when we use algorithms to kind of abstract humanity. Just, you know, not that, not that, you know, not that that's bad per se. It's just that it has implications that we then have to deal with on the other end. And so this is part of responsibly learning to use the technology, just as we would responsibly learn to use any other technology that is extremely powerful. 
So Susan, as we are kind of talking about how about what ethics are in AI and how to apply them, which is very personal for me as I've come into a new job in a new company, new industry, the defense industry, uh, where we're looking at AI use cases. I think this is the first time in my life where I'm almost leading with ethics. And I think, you know, there are many other people that will be in similar situations because AI has such tremendous capabilities. What types of advice do you have for people who are moving into jobs or are now having to face how does AI affect our products and services at our company? What kinds of things would you advise them to do in terms of the thinking that maybe they haven't had to consider in the past? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a few very straightforward things. The first is to understand that algorithms are as good as the data. You know, this is like the classic garbage in, garbage out, right? The algorithms are only as good as the data and the way the data is modeled. And you know, the data that we have in many cases is simply, it's just absorbed from society, right? You know, in the case of the Google uh, Word2Vec, or in the case of the Word2Vec data set that includes all that language stuff that I mentioned earlier, you know, it just absorbs the reality that we live in. And sometimes you want to perpetuate and amplify that reality. And sometimes you maybe don't. So for example, if you're creating an, uh, a segment, if you're a marketer and you want to do audience segmentation to doctors, you don't want anything assuming that all doctors are male, right? You're going to alienate all those female doctors out there and potentially even stifle the potential of younger female, you know, students who maybe want to get into the medical profession. So so we just need to know these things and we need to actually have processes in place to ensure that when we can and can fix and catch bias that we do. We can't change society, you know, by changing technology obviously, but we can be mindful about it. Um, the second thing is around uh, explainability. So there's a woman, Rachel Bellamy from IBM. I heard her speak in London not too long ago. And she said, explainability is the new user interface for AI. And I thought that was a really interesting point because one of the things we're not used to in probabilistic systems is the idea that you put data in and then there's this sort of black box and then there's the output. And so in many cases, we do need to understand what some of these, you know, what some of these decision criteria were. In some cases, it's fairly straightforward. You know, maybe there are a few kind of keywords that were determining the outcome or suggesting the outcome. And in in some cases, for example, maybe with disease diagnosis or with pharmacological types of use cases, it might be very, very complex, you know, or weather, you know, these very complex systems. So this idea of trying to understand the, you know, what happened between the input and the output is very important. So the people do have a sense of trust. You don't simply say, well, Chris, I'm not giving you a mortgage loan, even though you have, you know, financially pretty much the same profile as Daniel. And then three months later, you give Daniel the mortgage loan, even though he pretty much matched where you match. You have to be able to go back and and understand what happened. You have to understand a little bit about what caused that action to be taken. So explainability is interesting. And it's also become kind of a huge issue in the industry. And I think there's a lot of controversy around it. And then the third piece is, you know, there need to be, there needs to be an understanding that, um, that ethics in AI are simply just norms of behavior. And we don't really have norms of behavior in the digital world the way that we do in the physical world. You know not to push in front of somebody getting on a bus. You may do it anyway, but you know not to do that. We don't have those same norms in the digital world. And so having internal controls, making explicit the decision criteria, all those things are really important. I'm glad that you addressed that because that was actually going to be my next question is kind of what do you need in place around it uh, in terms of what you're calling internal controls so that the burden isn't entirely on the individual that is trying to figure their way through this and apply ethics, uh, you know, as they do that. From an internal control, do do you need systems in kind of AI implementation that you might not have needed uh, in other environments? And, and and if so, you know, what might they need to be thinking about? What, what might those systems need to be addressing? Yeah, we do need systems. Um, in some cases, it's like grandfathering existing, existing processes and controls, um, you know, grandfathering AI into that. In other cases, it's entirely new, entirely new types of controls. So for example, some industry examples out there, AI Now, which is a really phenomenal organization focused on ethics and AI, they've issued what they're calling an algorithmic 
algorithmic impact assessment, very similar to like an environmental impact assessment that when you're going to build something or excavate something that you need to understand the environmental impact. So this is built on that same premise that, you know, if you're going to introduce algorithms um, and algorithmic decision making into, in this case, it's, it's meant for governments and for cities. If you're going to introduce that into kind of a civic environment that you need to think through some of those potential impacts to uh, vulnerable people, to systems and processes and all those things. And so that document lays out kind of a template for assessing the impact of your algorithmic system. I think something like that can and should be customized for industry. That's one example. IBM has built a couple things that are quite interesting. One is called a supplier declaration of conformity. So imagine, you know, as a defense contractor or as a retail bank or as a healthcare provider, you're not only using your data, but you're using data and systems from other organizations, other companies. You want to make sure that you've gone through the process of understanding and holding your systems up to the highest scrutiny, but you also want to make sure that your suppliers and vendors and partners have done the same thing. So that's another example. They've also built, you know, and this is again, something that's a bit, I wouldn't say controversial, but it's open to scrutiny. This idea of a dashboard that shows kind of a bias quotient, right? So, and a confidence quotient. So as a simple example, if you're trying to settle car insurance claims, you should know that the data that you have for 19 year olds is very, very, very scant. Whereas the data that you have for like 42 year olds is very, very rich. And so if you're settling a car insurance claim on a 19 year old, you need to dig down into some other things and really probably use much more human intervention to understand what the situation was simply because those recommendations are based on just, you know, less rich data. These are just some examples of things that people are doing. Microsoft is rolling bias check into Word and PowerPoint. So if you use a word that you're maybe not aware of, has some kind of connotation that is hurtful or unpleasant, it will let you know the same way it'll let you know if you misspelled a word. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, piggybacking off of that, for my own selfish reasons, I want to ask the next question because I've taught a few uh, corporate workshops recently. And um, we kind of, of course, talk about, you know, uh, oh, you want to make your, you know, maybe you want to make your training set as representative of reality as you can. And then you try to optimize for accuracy or whatever it is. And then, you know, I bring up uh, bias and these issues that we're talking about. And and we in the midst of those discussions, I think every time I've done this, someone somewhere in the audience asks the question about like, well, if we include, you know, gender or uh, zip code or income or whatever it is in our model and it makes it more accurate, why wouldn't we want to do that? Isn't that just the accurate representation of reality, even though it produces a bias model. And I know kind of how I've tried to answer that question, you know, but I was curious your thoughts on on how you would help that sort of person understand why they should care maybe about bias in their predictions and why they they might want to consider that a little bit more seriously and, and not just talk about accuracy. Yeah, well, Daniel, you've hit on, I think, one of the most crucial issues around algorithmic bias we're going to see in 2019. And that is, there's a little bit of a storm brewing uh, between some data science scientists and engineers and sort of people, and I'll just be brave here and say people like me who run around talking about AI ethics. And here's why. It's really complicated. It's not, you know, and there is a tendency, and I've had this conversation with some data scientists, you know, who work at very well-known companies off the record. There's a tendency, I think, for some folks to kind of do a little social justice virtue signaling around, you know, these darn data scientists, they don't understand people and they don't understand humanity and they're going to ruin the world by allowing bias to creep in. And, you know, then on the other- Pardon me? No biggie. Yeah, no big, right? And then on the other side, we have data scientists saying, well, okay, so who, you know, elected you the arbiter of all that is good and just in the world? And these are both completely valid points of view. So here's where I stand on it. We do have to have this conversation with precisely the group of people that you're that you're talking about in a productive way. These industry conversations need to happen because as somebody who I'm not allowed to quote said to me not too long ago, who gets to choose who's the person who puts their finger on the scale? And that is really critically important because what we may ameliorate in terms of 
bias for one group, we may actually impact for other people or have unintended consequences that we're not even able to forecast. And I'll give you one simple example, okay? So if you think about what happened with Amazon's recognition system, where it incorrectly identified John Lewis and six members of the Congressional Black Caucus as criminals, as matching faces in their criminal facial recognition database, you know, okay, that's like arguably, I mean, it's not even arguably, that's unarguably bad. Like bad, 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 right? You know, we've got John Lewis, who's one of the greatest, you know, civil rights activists ever known to man, who is now basically, along with six members of the congressional block, been matched to a criminal. If this happens to John Lewis, you know, you can only imagine what's happening to other people. Yeah. And similar with like the recidivism models and other things that I've seen. Okay. So here's the other side. And this is why is this? Because image recognition and facial recognition is really much less accurate at recognizing and understanding people of color than it is in recognizing and understanding Caucasians. Okay, so how do you fix that? Do you make facial recognition better so that it uh, better identifies people of color? How are you going to get that data? Do you do you you know start encouraging people? Of co- no, no, no. Really, it's it'll be great for you. Just just give us your face data. You know, let us <laughs> let us analyze your face data. You know, and put you in our system. We promise that will just help in terms of accuracy. It won't have any you know b- uh, bad impact on you. Like this is a really you know who's going to say yes to that, right? And so this is yeah. a, you know some people will say you know we're we're perfectly happy you know, that the false positive rate is so high, like just let it stay high because uh, we don't want to be included in those systems. And, you know, there are absolutely valid reasons for that. So, you know, this stuff is not easy. And one thing I would say is I don't stand on a soapbox, you know, trying to say I'm more ethical than anyone else. I am cowed every single day by how complicated this stuff is. I just feel like we have to have these conversations. Yeah, I appreciate your perspective there. I, I agree that the discussions are are complicated because oftentimes immediately after I have that conversation and people are like, oh, well, we'll remove the gender column in our data set or whatever. But if there's, you know, 1,200 other features, who's to say that the, the model can't infer gender from, you know, from those other features? So the, the, it's not just a, like, take all the sensitive data out sort of thing. Yeah. And zip code, my God. I mean, there's no better predictor of your race than your zip code. And there's no better predictor of your health outcome than your zip code, not even your genome. So there is a way in which people could say very disingenuously, oh, well, we just, you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't include race. Race isn't a fact. We can't do that. It's a protected class. And, you know, and then, but we just chose zip code, (laughs) you know, like you, so this is why we all need to be educated about these things, right? The business people need to be educated about proxy data, And data scientists need to uh, kind of game out and scenario plan some of this stuff, or at least be part of that conversation. And we have to get past, you know, virtue signaling and actually into some real methodologies that people can get behind. At least monitoring for bias, at the least. Yeah. And and that's hard, too, actually, because, you know, who wants to be liable for that? Yeah. So as if this isn't uh, complicated enough, uh, trying to take all this into consideration, uh, we now have the reality of regulation and stuff coming into it. Obviously, uh, in Europe, you have the general data protection regulation, which we call GDPR for short. And when you throw that in the mix with all the other complications of trying to be ethical in your use of AI, uh, how does regulation impact that? You know, there's it seems like there's quite a balancing act that you that, that a practitioner is, is trying to manage through this process. Yeah, I mean, you know, GDPR is really interesting. <laughs> interesting is probably a diplomatic word. I mean, I will say I am a huge fan of GDPR as a philosophy. Right, because and yesterday, as a matter of fact, was the 70th anniversary of the UN Declaration of Human Rights that came out of World War II, and you know Eleanor Roosevelt was was involved in crafting that. And the whole point really was to protect protect the civil rights of individuals, protect their rights from unreasonable search and seizure, seizure, and and from discrimination and disenfranchisement, and actually you know physical harm, all these things, right, coming out of the Second World War. And GDPR is really built on on the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but from a digital standpoint, right, so that we should be in control of our own data. We should know when algorithms make decisions about us, why those decisions were made, and be able to contest them. And so from a philosophical and historical viewpoint, it's critically important. 
However, most of us experienced GDPR uh, in the weeks and months leading up to May 25th of this year as an onslaught of horrific opt-in emails and like then not being able to get to a couple of, you know, websites that we usually frequent and not a whole lot more than that. So, you know, there's theory and practice. There's the fact that GDPR and its enforceability is a little bit of a gray area for global company. I mean, if you're global, of course, you have to comply just in case people do wander into the EU. But, you know, fundamentally with, with regulation around technology, it is always so far behind the reality of the technology. You know, we're still literally in the, in the wake of the 2016 election, we're still literally grappling with, you know, is Facebook a magazine or a magazine stand? I mean, that's, you know, that's, the, <laughs> that's the law this is based on. And, and so when you think about it in those terms, I mean, yes, there does need to be protection. What protection? I am not an expert on that. So I guess as we start to uh, come to the end, uh, I want to pose it, and I'm trying to, to not scope this final question too big. I know in this paper that you've just put out, you kind of finish up by kind of taking practitioners through how to build up their playbook. With that in mind, maybe uh, if you could just kind of give us some pointers or some starting tips on how you might start that process, recognizing that that our listeners should definitely go download the playbook that you're offering on how to build their own playbook. But what are some good finishing points where you can leave them with uh, to get started on that process? Yeah, I mean, what I've published is really a meta playbook, right? It's a playbook for a playbook, as you just said. And uh, fair enough. <laughs> part of that is is that as a you know as an analyst firm, we publish our research for free as a service to the industry. So we, this is really intended to help people think through the issues that they need to think through in order to do what they need to do. And of course, you know, I'd, I'd probably be beaten around the head and shoulders if I didn't say that I'm more than happy to help with that if people need that. But there are five areas that I think are, are really critically important. The first is looking at your business strategy, you know, moving from kind of optimizing existing processes to actually, you know, business model innovation, customer experience, and using intelligent systems to enable those things. You know, in data science, you know, we're moving from kind of a specialty or an exotic, you know, an exotic specialty within organizations to the ability to scale. With product and service development, we're moving from kind of reactive, you know, taking in all the signals that, you know, about what's happened in the past to anticipatory, trying to anticipate what's happening. You know, we're finally getting to what we were promising for the last 20 years around agile enterprise. From an organization and culture perspective, we don't talk about this enough, but, you know, we're moving from a hierarchical to much more dynamic organizational culture. And when you have agile development in an organization and an agile mindset, it really changes the way people work together. And some people don't like that very much. And some people are highly empowered. And that makes uh, a lot of difference in terms of how AI, how successful AI can be. So one major piece of that is you have to have the willingness to fail and fail fast. And that doesn't mean move fast and break things because, um, you know, that's probably a relic of the last 10 years, but it does mean actually the ability to move in tandem very quickly, learn from mistakes and keep moving because that's just the essence of, uh, of these systems. And then finally, it's around ethics and, ethics and governments. We're not in the anything goes era anymore. We've seen in the last year tremendous stories about what happens when we don't pay attention to these issues. We do have to start thinking about the ethics and the customer experience of AI in a much more rigorous way. And, you know, as we talked about earlier, that's that's not the easiest thing to do, but at least there's some early thinking in here about how to start to frame those conversations internally. I really appreciate it. I love what you've done with this. Uh, for our listeners, we will have a link to the AI Maturity Playbook, uh, which pillars of enterprise five pillars of enterprise success in the show notes. And and Susan, if people uh, read through that and they they want to engage you uh, so that you can come in and help their organization, how would they do that? How would you like people to reach out to you? Yeah, I'd love to hear from people. You can so most directly, you can email me at susan at altimetergroup.com. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm S. Etlinger on LinkedIn and, or I'm sorry, I'm S. Etlinger on Twitter and obviously Susan Etlinger on LinkedIn. I'm easy to find. 
Fine. Great. Thank you very much for coming on the show. This was a, a great conversation. I so wish I had heard a conversation like this before I was uh, getting started in industry. So I think you're really helping some people uh, that, that are still trying to get in and, and, and get their organizations involved in this and thinking about it the right way. So thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you both so much for having me. All right. Well, thank you very much. And Daniel, I will see you in the next show. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, thank you for tuning into this episode of Practically High. If you enjoyed this show, do us a favor, go on iTunes, give us a rating, go in your podcast app and favorite it. If you are on Twitter or a social network, share a link with a friend, whatever you gotta do, share the show with a friend if you enjoyed it. And bandwidth for changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at fastly.com. And we catch our errors before our users do here at changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at rollbar.com slash changelog. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to linode.com slash changelog. Check them out, support this show. This episode is hosted by Daniel Whitenack and Chris Benson. Editing is done by Tim Smith. The music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at changelaw.com. When you go there, pop in your email address, get our weekly email keeping you up to date with the news and podcasts for developers in your inbox every single week. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.